Today we've got a surprise for you. What have you got here, Dad? What do you want to show us under this? This is Grandad's 1934-35 Sunshine Sundial 4 horsepower engine. Oh, beautiful. Now, you remember this as a kid, don't you? So what did you use it for? You used it for driving a mill to crush, crush grain. For, for chicken and pig feed. Yep. It's a beautiful example. Four horsepower. Now, we had this one beautifully restored. We had this one taken off the farm. And when we actually brought it back to Adelaide from the Air Peninsula in 2008, it was really badly seized. And you better see that if that turns a crank over. The conrod was actually completely seized. The piston was seized to the bore. But after pulling it all apart and having it rebuilt, she actually is still a goer. And it's something we wanted to do because Grandad, when he was on the farm and came from Australia, came to Australia from Poland was one of the only few people who actually knew how to operate this engine and could actually get it running. Now the reason why is because down here it's called a hit and miss engine and that's because the exhaust valve is controlled by a camshaft and a push rod but the inlet valve is purely just operated by air um, vacuum of the cylinder drawing the spring in. So it only draws in enough air and will create enough combustion when it really needs to. So it fires and then may tick over without firing for a couple of revolutions and then it'll decide to fire again. But we're going to see if we can get it going today. The way we're going to start this is by having a contingency plan of how to shut it down first because without knowing how to shut it down we're not going to be able to start it because it will run away if we get to that point. So there's two ways we can stop this thing. <laughs> if you come around here, you have a look. But this is the magneto. This is what creates the spark here. Right, I'm going to do away with these gloves now. Because we're done with the, handling the chemicals. This is a stop button. So this basically here interrupts the spark from the magneto all the way down to the spark plug and stops the spark from sparking through and keeping the firing happening with the fuel there. So we can kill it by that way, or we can kill it by a second way here, the intake valve. If we press it, uh, press it in, it's gonna stop us from building compression, which is, means it's gonna stop it from firing because it cannot build up or draw in that fuel from the car because the car is ground fed. So when I say it's inconsistent with any other engines ever built, these were the first type of engines ever built. So, this one, its particular design was to start on petrol and the original fuel tank had a majority, three quarters of the tank would run on kerosene. So you'd start it on petrol and then flick it over to kerosene. Every other engine built after this time realized the advantage of having the camshafts controlling the valves on the intake and the exhaust, the poppet valve engine, if you will, which is the exact type of design that this engine is a horizontally opposed poppet valve. So this type of engine, was very, very primitive. And this little lister here that we have, we'll be able to show you, has a very smooth running operation. And that is thanks to the advancement in technology in 1927 of this engine, which has your intake and exhaust valves operating on a common camshaft, overhead type poppet valve set up also. That's what makes this engine run far more smoother and consistently than the sundial. Right, so to start this, what we're gonna do, is we've got a bit of fuel here, this is 95 octane. So in here in Australia, we have 91 octane and we have 98 octane, which is your high performance 98. That's as much as you've got at the mainstream servos. We do have 100 octane, but it's in a form of ethanol. So we've just got 95 here, shooting straight down the middle of the line, which will mean that we can leave the fuel. Come and help me then, mate. This is typical dad, typical Brucey. <laughs> just like, yeah, yeah, do it yourself. No, you're all right. So look at there. We've got a little bit of fuel in the syringe, right? What we're going to do is inject this straight into the combustion chamber through the spark plug so we can get that spark happening straight away. So from the moment we 
add compression. <laughs> this is not the correct way to do it. However, I'm only using the big shifter spanner because I don't have a spanner that's big enough with a deep socket to fit this plug. Your spark plug always goes into your combustion chamber, which is where all the action happens, right? So I want to show you something really cool here. Shank, if you can go over there. We want to show you how this engine sparks. So if you zoom in right there, and I hold this in, crank it over, Shanker, and watch the spark right there. So the reason Luke Shanker was able to start it there is because we have the spark plug out, which means there's no compression being made. So we're not pressing the air against it. So what we're gonna do, inject a little bit of fuel into the combustion chamber. So from the moment she starts, crimp candle ones, this is the third way we can stop the motor. If we can't press the button on the magneto to kill the spark, and if we can't press this in, we can always just use a pair of pliers with an insulated handle to cut it off. Otherwise, you're gonna get a hell of a boot of whatever that magneto's mm. pumping out. So we're just gonna nip that there up. So this engine's effectively ready to go. This is what we're talking about. Insulated handle. Another way we can do it is just to pull this straight off like that, and that'll stop any spark from carrying on. Put that back on. Leave them in. Right, and so I can feel it that I'm right on top of compression. I'm coming up to compression stroke, so as soon as Luke decompresses that, that will be fire. So I won't keep cranking it, and when I say go, Luke, you just let it go. 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 Yep. takes off, it goes 10 times faster than that. I know, Dad. It'll flip them down. <laughs> How good is that? She got puffed. What? Yeah, quite. Two, three times? Two times. The reason I'm blowing the plug is because it's a little bit wet with fuel. And if it's too wet, it can blow out the ignition. So, what we're going to do is rock a little bit more fuel from this beautiful jar from Sham which is Polish uh, horseradish. <laughs> Ironic because granite was Polish when he first got this motor going. Uh... a few times then. Seems like he got a few. Chuff, 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 chuff. I think you got about four. Four chuffs. Four huffs and puffs. Go back to the instant replay. <laughs> yeah, back to the instant replay. <laughs> so through my very limited operation of making this engine operate, I've just discovered something very interesting, which I just came to me then. As the exhaust arm is actuating, it's pushing a little sub lever here, which is also connected down here into the fuel. So what it's doing is providing pressure into the tank to be able to come up here and I haven't had the lid of the tank on so I need to squish this one a bit tighter. I need to tighten it a little more so we can actually build up some pressure in the tank. Because what this line will do is it's providing a little bit of air pressure through a basic, basic seal every fourth stroke or every second stroke is every second revolution is creating a little bit of force through here to force the fuel up through the carving and then back up in here, so that's what's creating that. So the fact that we don't have that tightened is probably not doing us any favours in getting it running. That's one of those little tricks you probably come across. So what we can do to help prevent, to increase our chances of that opening, is basically put a little bit of drop of oil right here onto this piston, which will help us to seal as we rotate through those revolutions. figured out if we did a bit of work pulling the things apart just to have a look and find out what would be wrong. So we only had about 
7.5 litres, which is almost a gallon, just short of a gallon um, in here. So what we've done is we've pulled out all of this piping to have a look to the carby. What we realise is there's a one-way valve in here. So off your exhaust cam, there's a pump here, this pump, and it pumps down here, but what it actually does is it actually suction instead. So we figured that out as soon as we tried to blow in it and figured it out. I thought it was pumping to pump up some pressure in the tank. Not the case. It's actually running through suction here, through this one-way valve, drawing fuel from the tank through here and helping to suction up towards the carby. What we didn't do is prime that line. So anytime you get a ball valve, a check ball valve, you need to prime it behind the line, behind the ball, to get it to be able to start operating correctly. That's what we're doing now. <laughs> it's just adding some fuel in behind that check valve. And once we put it all back together, there's no reason why it shouldn't run. So we'll go there and we'll go to that one. Right, so it's a half inch spanner that we're using to do up these brass fittings, which are beautifully done. They're coming up to about, oh, what are we now, 90 plus years old, these fittings. Once you drain any car of fuel, be it diesel, be it petrol, it can take a while to reprime it, particularly diesels. Because once you get air in that system, it is incredibly hard to get them started again with air in the system. Out there, we, we tilted it like that. Yeah, Bruce is already all over it, but we yeah, were we bad. tried some new yeah, technology. Pick it up like it falls down. Oh, that's us! Look, what's this? <laughs> right, Granny once taught me with a big enough lever, you could actually move the planet, and that's all we're doing here. Just a simple lever here, short lever there. With a fulcrum point that loop started, you got to tip that block up on his head. That's it. And then we lift, loop takes it out, very easy pressure. And then all I do is let this one down onto the second pivot point, loop takes that water out, and then down we go. And that's how you do it with levers, folks. Very, wow. very simple. Right, I'm guessing it's gonna be about its third start now through the carby after we get it going. Um, because we've primed the lines to the fuel tank, there's no reason why she shouldn't start. She's got spark, she's got fuel prime now. So, let's hit it. Yep. I won't let you! Give us a hug, you can tell me. Look at him go. It's in love, man. You make me sick. <laughs> Get this back on the stroke. Come on. Oh, oh, oh it's also a bit warm. Oh, you think it's really hot? Can you say that again? Say it, say it. Come on, Dad, put the camera Dad's secretly scared of this beast. 
<laughs> I've seen what I can do. Yeah, he can see what he's doing back yeah, in the start. How old were you in the back in the 30s? <laughs> Do you know what uh, bore and stroke it is? I don't know what bore and stroke. Come and have a look at this. <laughs> Steve, Dad, can you grab a torch? It's about that. Uh, this is about like that. Can you just grab a torch? Grab a torch. <laughs> Great question. Well asked. We're going to show you what the bore and stroke look like. I don't actually know because this is uh, just. Standard is what it is. There's no parts available for this, nor is there any specifications available for anything so on. Very little. What I can show you is the inside of the piston there, which is moving, and I would say. Yeah, six, five, six inch piston. I was asked before what stroke and bore diameter size piston we had in this sunshine sundial engine. It's a great question. Here we have a very big piston out of some industrial equipment, probably a train or a ship, something like that. I don't actually know where this came from, but I do know that it came from my collection and my travels of different stuff being a heavy diesel mechanic fitter. So what I can tell you about this is, if you want to know what a definition of a stroke by piston diameter is measured across the top of the piston like this. So here we're looking at 215 millimeters across. All right, to the good part from the center. That's eight and a half inches for all our American friends. That's the diameter of your piston. Now to measure the stroke of your piston, you want to measure where the top of the piston sits at the very top of your block to the distance it travels at the very bottom. That distance is referred to as a stroke. Now, we can't measure the stroke of how far the piston travels just based on having a piston here, but we can measure the stroke of this engine here. And we've actually done that for you to give you some statistics on the piston itself. We worked out that it is 120 millimeters across or about four and three quarter inches across. So to give you the stroke, we actually took a measurement here. So if I put my thumb there, that's the very back of bottom dead center as we refer, refer to that in the shank here. So that's BDC. And we want to go to TDC, which is top dead center. So when the piston has finished moving all the way to the top, right in the center of where the crank meets up with the on rod, we will have that measurement from the center point right there, which gives us exactly five and a half inches of stroke, right? So that for us Australians is about 14 centimeters or 140 millimeters. That gives you the calculation so that this motor will tell you what you should have as cubic Capacity. Now we can work that out. That's another calculation for another video. We could actually work out the cc's or the capacity, cubic capacity of this engine. We'll do that in another video. But this one here produces four horsepower, and that's mainly due to the fact of the design of the engine being so primitive and so basic and being a hit and miss type design. So we've accurately calculated the cubic inches and the cubic centimeters squared capacity of this motor, the cc's. The cc's in Australian, in the rest of the world, is 1.583 litres. So it's 1.6 litres, closer to 1.6 if you round it up. For our Americans playing here at home, in Imperial, it is 96.6 .6 inches cubed. I think you'll understand that more than I understand it. But uh, that's how we have it here. So it's a 1.6 litre Almost motor, which is pretty crazy. It only produces four horsepower. Wow! But it's got torque to the wazoo, right? This thing, if you load it up with a belt, will actually give you so much torque that it's not funny. It'll pull things for days, but it'll only do it to the extent of four horsepower. But the torque, which is the ability to overcome momentum on this motor is incredible. This wow. engine, I should say, because some of you will pick me up in the comments. It's an engine. 
but in Australia we use slang a lot, so we call them motors. Motors or engines will produce a lot of torque. This one will produce a lot. So there you go. I'm done talking about this motor, so I'm going to leave you to something else. And come back for episode two where we actually get this thing running. I don't know when it's going to be. Full caveat, full disclosure. This thing needs a little bit of TLC, and I'm running out of time here to do this. So we're going to have to get in, stuck into it next episode, whenever we get that finished. And maybe, maybe Bruce will be here to help us start it. Maybe. <laughs> anyway, I'm Steve Dolly. Until next time, ciao.